Well, you guys are so impressive. Like in the first service, when we had our encouragement time, I was really specific. I said, one or two people, just take a second, that's all. And it took about 10 minutes for me to herd them back in and get them sitting down. And you guys are just really efficient. You follow instructions. I'll bet you all, well, that was two. I better sit down now. And so you are ready to go. And I, I can't tell you how much I appreciate that. If you're ever driving through northwest Ohio, one of the towns you may go through is Van Wert, Ohio. Probably some of you have been there and been through Van Wert, just a small little town. But as you come into Van Wert, there's a sign that welcomes you. And it kind of gives you a little bit of a taste of what the town is about, the history of the town. It says something like, Welcome to Van Wert, uh, named in honor of Isaac Van Wert, who was one of the captors of Major John Andre, British spy. That's kind of cool. I, I like history, you know, but, but I, the first time I saw the sign, I was like, what's the big deal, right? Because he's a spy. We live in this world where there's lots of spies everywhere. And there's probably even more than we know. And we think spies probably get captured all the time, you know, James Bond type stuff, not a big deal. And, and John Andre is a name that probably some of you know who he is, but many of us, yeah, I don't know who John Andre is, I don't know what the big deal is. But John Andre is kind of a big deal, because he wasn't just a British spy. He was the chief of British intelligence during the American Revolutionary War. And he was captured after he had had a meeting with an American general who we all know, whose name was Benedict Arnold. <laughs> me, 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 me. <laughs> Benedict Arnold, uh, the, the great villain of our country's founding, right? He was the guy who uh, committed treason, tried to sell the plans for West Point, tried to lead to a plot to have Washington killed. And, and, and had he been successful, we might all be talking with a funny accent today. But fortunately, John Andre was caught, the plot was uncovered, Benedict Arnold was determined to be a traitor. Now here's the thing. When we hear about Benedict Arnold, we think, what a, what a bad guy. He was a traitor, he committed treason, he turned on his country. And a lot of people think that probably he did it for the money because the British gave him a lot of money, or maybe he actually thought the British were going to win the war and he wanted to be on the winning side. But I think the real reason that Benedict Arnold committed treason, what, the reason he switched sides was because he didn't think he was getting what he deserved. And he was very concerned about receiving what he believed he deserved. You see, in the Battle of Saratoga, it was Benedict Arnold fighting for the American side who really turned the battle in our favor and, and caused us to win that battle. And that was one of the, the most, if not the most, crucial battles in the war. Because it was after the Battle of Saratoga that the French said, okay, so we think maybe you guys have a chance, we'll join up. Had the French not joined the war, we never could have won. And so the Battle of Saratoga was really the turning point of the war, and it was Benedict Arnold, literally, who won that battle for us. And yet he didn't get the respect that he thought he deserved. He didn't get the fame that he thought he deserved from that battle. He also wasn't getting paid. You see, our country was broke. We were bankrupt. We weren't even really a country yet. And none of our soldiers were being paid, but Benedict Arnold was angry and upset. He was incurring debts faster than he could pay them off, and he wasn't getting paid for his military service, and he felt like he deserved his pay, he deserved glory, he deserved fame, he wasn't getting any of that. And so when John Andre offered, hey, come to our side and we'll make sure you get everything you deserve, that was an opportunity Benedict Arnold couldn't resist. You know, spending too much time thinking about what we deserve or what we think we deserve can lead us to really bad places. It can lead us down a, a dark road. It can lead us to make really poor decisions. And yet all of us from time to time focus our attention and get consumed with the idea of what we think we deserve. Jesus is going to address that attitude for us today. We've been working our way through part of Matthew 5, and, and today we're going to look at a few more verses here where Jesus really talks about this, this idea of focusing too much on what I think I deserve. So if you have your Bibles or your phone or your tablet, you can open them to Matthew chapter 5, and we're going to be looking at verse, I'm sorry, yes, Matthew chapter 5, verse 38. Here's what Jesus says. 
You have heard it said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. So Jesus is quoting the law of Moses, and this is one of the most well-known parts of Moses' law, and probably one that all of us at some point have said, yeah, I like that law, right? Somebody, somebody insults me or offends me, I want to get them back. I deserve to get revenge. But this law was never intended to be justification or permission for us to take revenge. In fact, this was a law that's designed not to be carried out by individuals, but to be carried out by those in authority, whether it be the king or the judge or the government or or anyone else in authority. This is a law that's supposed to be carried out by those in authority. Here's how it was supposed to work in Moses' day. If someone in, in the Israelite camp was offended, they were not to go out and take vengeance for themselves, but they were to go to the authorities who would then determine whether or not their cause was just. And if their cause was just, then they would mete out the appropriate punishment, and the punishment was to fit the crime. So not not overly, not underly, but eye for eye, tooth for tooth. That was God's intent. It's a great law. Because here's the thing, it's it's actually a gift to us and to God's people. Because what God was essentially saying is, I don't want you to spend all your time focusing on, on how you're going to get what you deserve. I don't want you to spend all your time thinking about how you're going to take vengeance on those who have offended you. When someone does something wrong to you, I want you to put it into the hands of the authorities, and then you can focus on what you need to focus on. You see, God understands that that as humans, our natural inclination is to seek vengeance, right? If somebody takes, takes my car... I'm going to take their car and vandalize their house. Somebody knocks out my tooth, I'm going to knock out two of theirs. But here's the problem. When when we have that mentality, what happens next? Well, yeah, I took their car and I vandalized their house. Well, they just burned my house down. And I took two of their teeth. Well, they just took four of mine because we have this natural tendency as humans to just keep escalating conflict, don't we? It wasn't that long ago Uh, that there were two families, not far from here, in Kentucky and West Virginia, who had maybe the most famous family feud of all time, the Hatfields and McCoys. And we kind of think of them as some legend or some story, but it's true. It really happened. For almost 20 years, these two families were at war on the border between Kentucky and West Virginia. And over those 20 years, over a dozen people were killed because these two families couldn't get along. And it started, most likely over a pig. And I've got this funny idea in my mind is, how could they not know whose pig it was? The McCoys lived in Kentucky, and the Hatfields lived in West Virginia. So this must have been a pig that got around, right? It's like sometimes he's in West Virginia, sometimes he's in Kentucky, he's racing through the woods, but the Hatfields and the McCoys disagreed about whose pig it was. And this led into a big fight, an escalation. And eventually, the McCoys killed one of the Hatfields. And so the Hatfields killed two of the McCoys. And so the McCoys killed three of the Hatfields. And it went on and on. The Supreme Court of the United States had to get involved to to make this family feud stop. Why? Because they took vengeance into their own hands. And, And God is saying to his people with this law, I don't want you to take vengeance into your own hands. I want you to be able to focus on what's more important. I want you to be able to focus on me. I want you to be able to focus on those around you. And so if someone wrongs you, put it in the hands of the authorities and let them handle it. You see, here's here's a truth in life. Life is not going to go the way you want it to go. It's not. Bad stuff's going to happen to you. Life's going to take twists and turns that you don't see coming. There are going to be people in your life who mistreat you. It's going to happen. And, And when people mistreat you, when you're mistreated, you have a choice to either become bitter or better. Benedict Arnold became bitter. He didn't get what he thought he deserved. He he was being mistreated, and he focused on that mistreatment. He let it consume him, and it turned him into a bitter man who did a terrible thing. The Hatfields and the McCoys allowed the mistreatment from the other family to cause him to become bitter and to take out vengeance on one another. And what God wants from his people is that when we are mistreated, he wants us to let that make us better. In fact, he says that in James, in James chapter 1, 
James says, hey, my brothers, whenever you suffer trials or mistreatment, rejoice. That's not our first response usually, is it? Woohoo! bad things. But then he says, why? Because it will make you more mature. It will make your faith complete. You see, if you allow the trials, if you allow the mistreatment to work its course, it makes you better. Sometimes it makes you better because it helps you focus on what's really important. You know, those people's opinion of me isn't really important. I can focus on something else. Sometimes it makes us better because it builds our perseverance and our endurance. Sometimes it makes us better because it encourages us to work a little bit harder. Sometimes it makes us better because it reminds us we need to be devoted to prayer, not revenge. Sometimes it makes us better because it reminds us that we need to rely on God because we'll let ourselves down and everybody else will let us down, but he never will. So when we're mistreated, we can leave it in his hands and allow mistreatment to make us better instead of bitter. Unfortunately, by the the time Jesus came, it had been thousands of years since Moses, and really the people had forgotten the original intent of this law, right? That that it's for me to let go of my problems. Instead, they were using it as justification to seek revenge on each other. And so Jesus now is speaking to people, and he says, you've heard it said... You've heard it said, eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. Now, let me say something different to you. So let's go on into the next verse, verse 39. But I say to you, do not resist the one who is evil. But if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. And if anyone would sue you and take your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. And if anyone forces you to go one mile, go with him two miles. So so what Jesus says first is, do not resist. Don't resist those who do evil to you. And when he says resist, what he means is, don't entrench yourself against someone or something. Several years ago, uh, Mary Ann and I took a group of high schoolers to the Outer Banks of North Carolina. And one day we were all out on the beach and we decided to build a massive sandcastle, right? Right? Now, the problem with sandcastles is they always get destroyed by the ocean, right? The ocean, the tides rise, it destroys the sandcastle. But we decided we wanted our castle to stand forever. And so we split into two teams. One team would build the castle, and the other team would build the entrenchments around the castle. And I got put on that team because I'm not a detail person. I have really fat fingers and fat thumbs, so I can't do little detail work. It also makes it hard for me to text, and so if you get a text from me that looks funny, it's my fat thumbs that did that. So I got put on the digging ditches and building walls team. And so we're digging these ditches around the castle, and we're building walls around the castle, and the other team is creating this massive, huge castle. And this is the greatest thing ever, but then the tide starts to come in. And what happens? It knocks down our walls and it fills up our trenches. So what do we do? We dig deeper trenches and we build bigger walls. And it became this all-consuming battle, us against the ocean. And we poured everything we had into it. We wouldn't stop. We wouldn't give up because we were going to defeat the ocean. Well, you know how this ends, don't you? We won. Because we went out the next morning and our castle was still there. We had entrenched ourselves against the ocean. Now, I don't think it's still there today. But we had entrenched ourselves against the ocean. We had poured everything that we had into resisting it. And here's what Jesus is saying. Don't do that. Don't pour your life into resisting other people. Don't pour your life into fighting against those who want to fight you. People are going to insult you, right? Right? People are going to abuse you. People are going to oppress you. Don't pour your life into fighting against them. If someone slaps you, that's an insult, right? He doesn't say punch, he says slap. He's talking about being insulted. If someone insults you, your natural tendency is to do what? Insult them back. And you hold on to that insult, don't you? You think about it. You meditate on it. It becomes all that consumes you. How am I going to get this person back. And we hold tightly to the insult, and we let it control us, and it turns us bitter. And Jesus says, let it go. Don't resist it. Don't fight it. Don't entrench yourself. Let it go. If somebody abuses you, 
he uses the example of someone taking you to court. He says, if someone sues you for your tunic, that's your coat. He says, you know what? Don't let it consume you. Don't hold tightly to that. In fact, give him your shirt too. Let it go. Show them that you can be generous. If someone compels you to walk a mile, here he's talking about government oppression. I mean, it sounds like a funny thing to say. If someone compels you to walk a mile, that doesn't happen to us. I'm out walking my dogs and someone comes up and says, you're going to walk another mile with me. That just doesn't happen. But back in that day, the Roman soldiers were by law allowed to compel anyone to carry their gear for a mile, but not further. They could make you carry it a mile, but then you had to, to put it down. And Jesus says, look, if you're being oppressed by the authorities, by the way, we have more authorities than just the government, don't we? If you're being oppressed by your boss, if you're being oppressed by local authorities, if you're being oppressed by your parents, don't hold tightly to that. Don't be controlled by that. Don't let that make you bitter. I see so much bitterness in our world today because people think they're being oppressed. Don't let that make you bitter. Let it go. Jesus says, you know what? If they make you walk a mile, walk another one. Just show them that they're not in your head. Just show them that you're not going to fight this. Let it go. Be generous. So Jesus says, don't spend all your time resisting. Don't be controlled by this natural response to fight back. Instead, he says something else. Listen to what he says. Verse 42. Give to the one who begs from you, and do not refuse the one who would borrow from you. Now, here's the cool thing. When someone begs from you, or someone asks to borrow from you, they don't deserve it, right? That's, that's the point of begging and borrowing. They don't, they don't deserve it. And so what Jesus is saying is, look, you're going to be treated in a way that you don't think you deserve. I don't deserve to be insulted. I don't deserve to be sued and abused. I don't deserve to be oppressed by the Roman soldiers. I don't deserve that. Jesus says, look, when people treat you in a way that you don't think you deserve, let it go. And instead, treat people who don't deserve it from you with generosity. Give to the people who don't deserve it. So Jesus says, do not resist. Do give. To give is to willingly offer without hope of payment. Sometimes we think we're giving and really we have ulterior motives. Uh, can, Can you imagine that if today out in the parking lot I met Mike and I said, hey Mike, I need you to go into the building real quick here And I want you to gather up all the donuts that are in the cafe and bring them to my office. I am really hungry today. I'm not going to make it through the services if I don't get some energy. And I'm going to eat all the donuts. So will you go get those for me? And Mike says, David, you know, I feel that you're hungry. I get that. But those donuts are for other people. And there's a lot of people who are going to come to church this morning who are going to want a donut. And if you take them all, what are we going to tell them? I said, all right, Mike, I'll give you two dollars. And Mike says, sold, done. He goes and gathers the donuts. Now, now, am I I giving Mike $2 here? I mean, in in a way I am, right? But is that really a gift or is that a bribe? It's a bribe, isn't it? I'm paying him to do something for me. Sometimes we like to think of ourselves as being generous because we give to others. But in our minds we're saying, I'm expecting something in return, Right? I'm expecting to get something back from you. I do this sometimes as a dad. I give my kids stuff. And I I love my kids. I'm I'm generous. I love them. But sometimes I want a hug in return. And sometimes they don't give me a hug because they're too old to hug their dad. Sometimes they do give me a hug. But when they don't give a hug, I'm like, oh, I I I just gave them $10 and they didn't give me a hug. I was bribing them. I wasn't being generous. To give is to willingly offer without hope of repayment. And Jesus says, even when people don't deserve it, you need to give to them. Now understand here, he's not talking about enabling bad behavior. But what he's saying is, if someone has a legitimate need, and they come to you, and you can legitimately meet that need, then you should. You should be generous with them. You know, this whole whole section of Matthew 5, Jesus is telling us, here's what the law says, and the law is important. 
But what it's really about is your heart. So I don't want you to get lost in the words of the law and miss out on, on what's really going on in your heart. So remember where we started a few weeks ago. Jesus said, don't be someone who escalates conflict, but instead seek re- reconciliation. And he said, don't be, don't be someone who gets distracted by what the world offers, but be content with what God has provided. He said, because God is faithful to you, even when you're faithless to him, you ought to be faithful to him and to those around you. He said, because Jesus is the ultimate truth in life, his followers ought to be people of integrity. He's getting at our hearts. And so now here, what's he saying? Here he's saying this, don't be so caught up in what you think you deserve Instead, be a generous person. You see, a generous person is one who lives life with an open hand. What do I mean by living life with an open hand? Well, to live with an open hand means when people insult you, or people abuse you, or people oppress you, you're willing to let go of it. You don't hold on to it. You don't let it control you. And it means when you have the ability to give to those around you, You willingly give. That's what it means to live with an open hand. That's what a generous person is. So let me me talk to you for a a couple minutes about four stages of generosity that I've observed. So as we think about how to grow our generosity, how to mature our generosity, I think there's four stages that we go through. The first is the stage of satisfaction. Here's where I say, I have what I need to be happy and fulfilled. That's a fairly simple one. I have what I need to be happy and fulfilled. So I don't have to look around and and see what everybody else has. I don't have to look around and see all the stuff I don't have. I look at what I have. This is enough. I'm happy. I'm fulfilled. Now, there are times all of us wrestle a little bit with this, right? Man, I could really use a new TV. Man, I wish I had a new goldfish. Whatever it might be, I, I, I just need one more thing and then I'll be happy. If I want to grow my satisfaction... I need to be grateful. You know, Ron talked about this this morning. Thankfulness helps us become more satisfied. When I focus on everything that God has given me, I can be satisfied with that and know that I don't need more. The second stage is contentment. And contentment's a little different than satisfaction. Contentment is when I get to the point where I can say, I could lose everything and still be happy and fulfilled. Because I recognize that my joy and my fulfillment doesn't come from what I have, but it comes from who I have, what's been done for me. There's a guy in the Bible who models this for us. His name was Job. Job had everything. He was wealthy. He was popular. He just had everything you could ever imagine in life, and he lost it all. And even though he lost it all, and he was sick and suffering, what did he say? Though he may slay me, yet will I praise him. And I'll still trust God because I know that even if I lose everything, I still have the one thing I need, and that's my Heavenly Father. That's contentment. Contentment comes when I can say, I could lose it all and I'd still be all right. And if I want to grow that kind of contentment in my life, that kind of maturity in my life, I need to constantly remind myself of what Jesus has done for me. I need to constantly remind myself that he who did no sin was crucified for me who did lots of sin. And so that I could give him my imperfection, and in return he gives me his perfection, so that when God looks at me, he doesn't see me as an awful, evil person, but he sees me through the blood of Christ, which means he sees me as righteous. He sees me as perfect, just like Jesus. That's been given to me, not because of anything I did, not because I deserve it, because I don't, but it's been given to me because Jesus loves me. And when I remind myself of that constantly, the contentment grows because I realize I could lose this all. I could lose everything I have, but I'd still have Jesus, and that's enough. The third stage of generosity is what I call gracious giving. Here's here's where I'm willing to say, I will give what I have even to those who don't deserve it. I will give what I have even to those who don't deserve it. You know, we we keep saying this word, don't we? Deserve, deserve, deserve. Because we all have an idea of what we deserve 
and we have an idea of what others deserve. And this isn't a word that Jesus uses very much. It's not a word that God uses very much, other than to remind us that we don't deserve anything except for separation from him. Because Jesus is not about giving us what we do deserve. He's giving us what we don't deserve, which is grace and love and mercy. And so the expectation then is those of us who are in him graciously give to others what they don't deserve. So if my friend or my neighbor or my family member comes to me with a need, even if they don't deserve it, if I can meet that need, why wouldn't I? That's generosity. And then the final, the final phase of generosity, and this is the most difficult, is sacrificial giving. And, and this is where I say, I am willing to give what I have to others even if it costs me dearly. This is not easy, is it? But this is exactly what Jesus did for us. You see, Jesus saw our need. We were sinners. We were imperfect. We were messed up. We were broken. Desperately in need of a do-over, of a second chance. And so he came to earth and, and he lived a perfect life. And at the end of his perfect life, it was time for him to give that life away and die an unjust death. And remember in the garden... He said to his father, Father, if there's another way to do this, that would be great. But nevertheless, not my will, but yours. What Jesus was saying was, I will meet this need for those whom I love, even if it costs me my life. Sacrificial giving. Most of us aren't asked to make that great of a sacrifice. But as you look around you, you can see others in need. You know, I, I see this person in need over here, and I could meet that need, but, but if I do, it means I can't buy that boat this summer. I'm going to have to sacrifice. And, and, and I could meet this need over here, but if I meet that need, then I can't do that vacation we had planned. But this is the heart of generosity, is when we, like Jesus, are willing to say, I'm willing to give what I have to meet the needs of others, even if it costs me dearly. You see, Jesus is calling us not to be people who focus on what we deserve. Not to be people who are controlled by what we want. Not to be people who are embittered because we're not getting what we think we are owed. But Jesus is calling us to be generous, giving, gracious people who meet needs even when it costs us. You see, Everything that we do, we do because of what he did for us. Everything that we are, we do because of who he was for us. Everything we say, our conversations, should be driven by what he says about us. You see, Jesus, who was God, became man and gave his life, and now he says that we are his brothers and sisters the children of God. That's why we come together on Sundays. So that we can be reminded of who He is. Because if we know who He is, we know who we should be. So that we can be reminded of what He did, so that we can do what He did. So that we can be reminded of what He says about us, so that our conversation is guided by that. That's why we come together on Sundays. That's why we come to the table. That's why we celebrate communion. So that we can remember who he was and what he did and what he says about us. Because he was not only just God, he came and became a man. Flesh and blood. And he allowed his flesh to be broken and his blood to be spilt. To pay the price for our sins. To make us new. To give us that new opportunity. And so we are generous people because he is a generous God. We are generous people because Jesus was a generous Savior. And when we come to the table, it reminds us of what he did and who he was and what he says so that we can go out and be who he was and do what he did and talk as he talked. So this morning we're going to come to the table. We're going to have the band come up right now and, and get ready to play. And we're going to celebrate communion this morning. It, it, it's our chance to remember that, that his body was broken for us. That's the bread. It's our chance to remember that his blood was spilt for us. That's the juice. It's our chance to remember who he was and what he did to inspire us.
to be that and to do that in the world around us. Here at the gathering, when we celebrate communion, uh, we call it open communion. And here's what that means. That we don't have rules or regulations about who's allowed to participate here. Uh, this, is, this is something that's, that's set aside for the children of God. Uh, anybody who, who knows Jesus and is following Jesus is welcome to participate. So whether this is your thousandth Sunday at the gathering or your first Sunday at the gathering, if you're a Christ follower, you are welcome at the table with us. In just a minute, I'm going to pray. And then after I pray, the, the band will play. And as they're playing, you're invited to come and, and take one of the crackers and, and take one of the juice and go back to your seat. And then once everyone's been served, I'll come back up here and together we'll remember what Jesus did for us. Let's pray. Father, we are so grateful for your generosity towards us. We are grateful that you were willing to, to give us your son and that he was willing to give us his life. And we desire to be people who live up to that standard. We desire to be people who are generous because of your generosity. And now as we uh, come to the table together, remind us of what you have done for us. Remind us of who you have made us to be. In your name, amen.